Hello there, welcome to episode 88 of Nevermind the Bullens. It's your bite-sized Everton podcast and vodcast. Uh, I'm Mike Peters. Uh, episode 88, of course, uh, two fat ladies. And uh, two fat ladies may have been more used to us on Saturday than Paul Tierney and uh, Chris Kavanagh were. Uh, in fact, any ladies would have been more useful to us on Saturday than Paul Tierney and Chris Cavanaugh were, but we'll get to all that uh, in just a minute. Uh, firstly, uh, the sort of major club news of the week, uh, of course, is the appointment of Kevin Thelwell as the uh, new uh, director of football. So um, third time lucky, we hope, after uh, Steve Walsh and Marcel Brands. And looking from what seems to have come out about it, what his brief is, it seems quite clear that his um, brief is to, is to impose a strategy... Uh, across the entire club in terms of how we play through the age groups, through uh, with working with David Unsworth, through the academy, uh, through the under-23s, etc., and up into the first team. And the crucial thing is, it doesn't matter who you could appoint, you could appoint, you know, Joe Bloggs in that role. They've got to be allowed to actually do, he's got to be able to do what he's actually been employed to do. And I'm hoping now, uh, as are many of us, I'm sure, that after the, the fiascos of... Marcel Brands and uh, and Steve Walsh in terms of not being able to being interfered with on a regular basis that he is actually able to do his job uh, to the best of his abilities and can work to really have a focused strategy working with Frank Lampard and the rest of the team uh, behind the scenes to create that strategy that hopefully will enable us to uh, you know sort of impart an Everton style of play through uh, those age groups right up to the first team so that when we do get youngsters coming through and making the club more sustainable um, in terms of shelling out rather than shelling out enormous transfer fees on a regular basis that we can have more Anthony Gordons etc in the team that actually they come in and they hit the ground running and are only you know need to get up to the pace of the Premier League rather than having to sort of get used to the different styles of play of different managers so that's the hope isn't it? That was the dream. So that was a, a bit of positive and mildly unexpected news, I suppose, um, on the eve of the, uh, of the Manchester City game. A bit of a blow, obviously, not having Dominic Calvert-Lewin um, fit for that game. Um, and looking at the way that the game panned out, actually, what difference would he have made playing through the middle against Richarlison, who was excellent, I have to say, uh, in that sort of lone striker role. And if Richarlison had been out uh, on the right-hand side instead of Alex Iwobi. Although, to be fair, Alex Iwobi, I have to say, Ran around, was extremely industrious. He's still a bit powder puff when he comes to get knocked off the ball, but he's winning balls back and, again, chanting his name. Uh, second game uh, on the run, I've had to stand up for the entire 90 minutes for. I don't think that's going to happen against Boreham Wood on Thursday, but you never know. But as I said in the last episode, what we wanted to see, above and beyond you know, the result, the, the result was almost academic, to be honest, but we wanted to see a performance. And I have to say... He got his system right. He got his personnel right. Um, the three in the middle, I thought, were fantastic. Uh, Alan's best game for quite some time. He was given license because he had Abdullah Decore there. Decore's engine is brilliant. And that then gave Donny van der Beek a license as well. And the way the passing angles that we were finding through that midfield, lovely little sort of wall passes almost, one-two touch, get moving the ball quickly around, short five, ten-yard passes, um, with Anthony Gordon and Alex Iwobi moving around as well, was excellent, um, particularly in the first half. We couldn't keep those energy levels up, and we, those energy levels did drop off in the second half, and Manchester City did get better because they were really not very good in the first half at all. I think that Kevin De Bruyne shot from 20-odd yards, which is a bit of a pot shot, really, that Jordan Pickford comfortably saved, uh, was their only real effort uh, in the first half, and, and we played really well. Exceptional stuff in the first half. Really strong performance. Um, defended well uh, as well. Um, Michael Keane and Mason Holgate, uh, all other than the goal, defended extremely well. John Joe Kenny again played really well. Seamus Coleman was was at it as well. And so huge amount of positives to take out the game. Um, and potentially, you know, I think if we drawn the game, don't really think anybody could have quibbled. Um we had to obviously it was a bit more back to the wall second half, um, but we would have been good value I think for, for a point. Um, obviously, you know they get a very fortunate goal. Uh, Michael King completely wrong footed by a, you know a bit of a miskick, a bit of a deflection from Mason Holgate, and then Phil Foden nips in. And uh, what a narc he is! Even though I think he's an excellent player, it's really the first time I've really seen him sort of be really naughty. Uh, and you know winding people up and reacting to things and all the rest of it um and 
Unfortunately, uh, the referee did very little. As soon as I realised it was Paul Tierney referee, and I, my heart sank, um, and with with good reason, uh, as was proved later on in the game, he just didn't get to grips with Ruben Diaz, who was constantly getting to grips with Richarlison, and sort of indulging in the the, the dark arts of uh, of defensive play. And uh, I mean, Ruben Diaz, I think, is a, a super player, you know, but was uh, well versed as continental defenders can be in uh, the, all the nudges and the pushes and the pulls and all the rest of those little little niggly bits and referee didn't get to grips with that at all didn't give us any protection whatsoever um and the sort of the idea of that referee in performance i'm not quite sure donny van der Beek got him booked in the first half um i thought he was again excellent he might have found as well talking about those that midfield three um when we played last year with a midfield three, and it was uh, Alan Abdelai Decore and Andre Gomez under Carlo Ancelotti, uh, and we're thinking yeah, Andre Gomez just didn't quite fit into that three. It was a bit of a square peg round hole kind of situation. And I'm wondering, actually, is Donny van der Beek the man that can actually be that third wheel in that in that midfield three, if that's the way that we're going to play going forward? Um, because um, I thought he was superb, and you know, it looks the player that Manchester United signed for 35 million quid uh, a couple of seasons ago. Whether he, I think he's already made sort of noises that he doesn't want to go back to United. And you've got to say, you can understand why if he's only had four starts in a year and a half. If we can be the beneficiaries of that and he wants to stay at Goodison, then happy days as far as I'm concerned. And even when Deli Ali came on as well, he was really industrious. He really starts to be looking like he's getting back to that sort of match sharpness. Yeah, we haven't necessarily seen it in, in an attacking uh, sense yet. Maybe we'll see that on, on Thursday against Boreham Wood and more of that later. But the substitutions were made at the right times. The right personnel was brought on. Um, obviously, we were a bit lightweight in terms of changing things up top in terms of a, a more focal point for you know rather than replacing Richarlison. But trying to hit them on the break as they pressed higher and higher. And Ruben Diaz and Amaric Laporte were playing basically on the halfway line for most of the second half. So trying to spin behind them and, and getting Damari Gray on to sort of run at them because there were times when I was just screaming at Alex Awobi to... He's got Victor Anichibiitis. And if you remember watching Victor Anichibi where he just never bust a gut to get in the box. And Alex Awobi has that same thing where you're thinking, Abdullah Decore broke through the middle. Richarlison's out on the left-hand side, plays it to him, and you think thinking, Awobi should be absolutely hairing into the penalty area to get somewhere around the, sort of the centre of the goal or the back post, and he just doesn't do it. And he has the pace, but he doesn't do it. He doesn't have the instinct or the nous to do that. And you're just thinking, getting Damari Graham was absolutely the right thing to try and affect them with a bit of pace. Um, and obviously getting behind them then results in the, the incident um, that has had everybody talking over the past uh, couple of days. In real time, I thought that, because I was sat at the Gladys Street, I only get to see it once, obviously. I thought um, uh, Rodri uh, had his arms down by his sides. Um, but, of course, it went to VAR. Um, <laughs> wasn't given by Chris Kavanagh, who, of course, has got previous uh, that Manchester United game, which was the last game we had before uh, the pandemic hit, where uh, the goal was ruled out when uh, Gilvey Sigurdsson was in the way of, or well, allegedly in the way of David De Gea, um, and we should have won that game 2-1, which culminated in Carlo Ancelotti then remonstrating with Kavanagh and getting sent off. Um, but then, as soon as I left the ground, my phone started going bananas with people saying, penalty, 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 should have been a penalty, and it should have. Alan Shear, everybody, un absolutely unanimous. Even Dermot Gallagher trying to come up with some cockeyed idea as to why he might not have given it. But, you know, the sound you could hear behind Dermot Gallagher on Ref Watch on Sky Sports News was the straws being clutched at because there's no reason that that should not have been given. Absolutely dreadful decision. And this is twice now. In relatively short order, this has happened to us. It happened against Tottenham, where Richarlison was brought down by Hugo Lloris. A penalty was given. Uh, by the referee on that day, who who has escaped me uh, right now, uh, was it Craig Pawson? Somebody will correct me. And then whoever was the VAR official that day overturned it, even though the evidence was clear that it was a foul. So that's now potentially that game we drew nil nil. We could have won it by goal to nil. That's another two points. On Saturday we lose the game one nil. That could have been because it came after the goal. Could have been us drawing the game one all. That's another three points, which pushes us up the league and gets us a little bit further away than the Burnley et al who are starting to catch us up. So these are having 
you know, really crucial and fundamental and impact on where we are in the table. It's not the only reason we should, you know, I'm not making excuses saying it's VAR's fault we're in the mess we're in. It isn't. But if the decisions are got right, which is the whole point of VAR to kind of get rid of the howler, like DRS in cricket, then the fundamentally that fund system fundamentally has not worked two minutes he spent looking at that on saturday we're all stood there twiddling our thumbs and then there were incidents in injury time as well with edison uh, having his back I and mean, there was a lot of time wasted from man city i mean jordan pick for time wasting the first half so i mean from minute one almost so i'm not going to quibble about that but paul tierney did not add enough time on um it didn't look like we were necessarily going to get that goal the equalizer but still that it was just a, hu- a complete shimozzle from from the get go, um, and and now obviously we've written to the Premier League. I mean, it's almost a bit of a, a pointless exercise, more of a sort of a not a vanity exercise necessarily, but more of a gesture to say that we are clearly unhappy with this, rather than as expecting I'd imagine anything positive to come of it. But if VAR is designed to get rid of those types of mistakes, then as far as Everton are concerned, it is squarely failing at its fundamental purpose. You know, yesterday in the Carabao Cup final, you see Lukaku looking like he's onside on the lines of the grass, but deemed offside with that chance that he... So I don't quite understand. So there's got to be more transparency. It's got to be quicker. And the, fundamentally, the decisions have to be right. Um, I think, do we have VAR on Thursday? I think we do, because, of course, the game's been played at a Premier League round. As we uh, distract ourselves from the league for now, because uh, the Spurs to come a week on Monday... Um, a week today, in actual fact, as I record this. Um, and Boreham Wood at home in the Cup on Thursday. It'll be a great evening, great occasion. Fifth round Cup tag against the non league team. Um, an opportunity to get some, uh, you know, the likes of Deli Alley in the team. Um, Dominic Cavalier is probably not going to be there, obviously, he's out for a week to 10 days. So hopefully he will be fit for Tottenham uh, next Monday. But you would imagine that if we take that kind of work ethic into the rest of the games of this season, we should be comfortable and be able to get the wins that we need to get ourselves away from the mess that we're in. And certainly should have enough to overcome uh, Boreham Wood. They're going to come out of the traps, they're going to come at us. We have to be on the ball. We can't just sit there and, you know, wait and because we're going to end up coming a cropper. But hopefully this will be a good distraction and then can allow us to maybe take that performance and convert it into a win, which can then lead on potentially to a league win uh, or very least a point away at Tottenham because they are a bit hot and cold at the minute. Spurs obviously gave Leeds a uh, thumping, but then Leeds are conceding goals for fun, hence Marcelo Marcelo Bielsa's uh, departure. Um, But that is a really important game in the context of the season. An FA Cup quarter final gives something positive to look forward to and allows us to try and get some uh, goals in the in our legs and uh, and try and say that we actually we can win matches, you know, um, as we as we head uh, to try and get ourselves away from the uh, from the bottom of the table or the near the relegation zone at the very least. Uh, if you want to get in touch, you can do at NMTB Pod. Uh, always welcome your feedback. NMTB Pod at gmail uh, This has been a top content production, and until episode eighty nine after the Boreham Wood game on uh, Friday, the episode will drop. Come on, you Blues. <laughs>